Hi everyone. Um, so having a great Sunday here. Got to attend the traditional Latin Mass at my local parish. Got to use the Roman Missal I found on my bookshelf at my parents' house that I wasn't even aware I had, um, and use that for the first time at, at my new parish. Um, loved it. Great Mass. It was a low Mass this week because of the whole coronavirus thing, um, but still it was glorious. And now we pray the traditional prayer for protection against the plague uh, afterwards. So that was really kind of neat. Um, anyway, so in this video, I wanted to respond to something I watched yesterday. I believe it was first aired back in October on Taylor Marshall's YouTube page. And the topic of the video um, was on Pachamamas and Bishop Barron on... Henri de Lubac. And I, I want to start by saying, first of all, that I actually really do appreciate many things that Taylor Marshall and Tim Gordon, who was the guest on the show that day, you know, the whole TNT um, lineup, you know, they play off each other well. I've watched a lot of their videos. I agree with a lot of things they say. Um, there's some things that I don't agree with them on. Um, but in you know they do try to at least I know they have a good intention of presenting sound Catholic doctrine, um, but I think sometimes they they get it wrong. We all do. Look, I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, first of all, regarding Henri de Lubac, um, you may have actually heard me refer, refer to myself as de Klubach, and that's actually because a friend of mine um, in grad school nicknamed me that um, because my last name is de Clou. And Henri de Lubac, de Klubach. Anyway, but I studied a lot of de Klubach's writings during my studies. You know, I worked on, I had my undergraduate degree in theology and I'm finishing my third graduate degree in theology. Um, and over time, I became increasingly intrigued by the whole nature grace debate that he was involved in. There was this argument between Henri de Lubac and certain neo Thomist scholars on the other side of it. And I was always sort of intrigued because I understood the you new know, scholastic idea of the need for a distinction or, you know, between nature and grace, that they can't be reduced to one another. And you can have a tendency of either supernaturalizing nature or naturalizing grace and neither is good. You need to avoid that. And I agree with that. Um, but then, you know, Henri de Lubac, uh, you know, and I hadn't really at this point studied a lot on it. I just had kind of heard things here and there um, about the notion that, but God created the world and thus the the actual world of nature in order to bestow grace. The whole purpose of creation was to enable him to offer himself to us. So that was the telos. That was the theological goal of God's creation. It wasn't something you know, that he changed his mind later and said, well, now I want to do this. Like in the actual concrete world, not some hypothetical realm, but in the concrete world, he created to offer himself to man. And so that was from the beginning, his purpose of creating man was to offer man union with himself. Um, so, you know, that's about all I knew that there were these arguments back and forth and I could kind of see, well, there's good points on both sides. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting topic. And I really didn't know where I would fall on it because I hadn't studied it in depth. I didn't really have what I felt to be sufficient knowledge of the arguments to decide, yes, they're right, they're wrong. Um, so it just kind of kept coming up over the years, um, but I was busy studying other things. But eventually in um, December of 2012, I wrote a term paper for one of my doctoral seminar courses um, on that debate. I, I decided the only way I'd be able to do this is if I could pick it as a topic and really delve into it. And I really wasn't, you know, I didn't know where the paper was going to go. I just sort of del dove into that topic, started reading Delubac on it, started reading articles on it, started reading the Neotomus on it, and trying to figure out what this was all about. And while I was pouring through the various sources, I sort of had a eureka moment. I still remember, I was sitting there reading a book, and I, I was reading, it was one of Delubach's books, and I went, oh, now I see what he's trying to say. Like, it just clicked for me. Um, 
I don't want to get into all of the nitty gritty of that, but um, it really kind of helped me understand what his actual position was and what he was trying to argue. Um, and so, you know, I kind of began to have a lot more appreciation for what he was doing. Um, now, to take a little bit of a step back, Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon um, rightly praised St. Thomas Aquinas for his ability to put forward his opponent's best arguments honestly before arguing against them. He may have even, Taylor Marshall may have even mentioned that in the, that same video. And that's true, that practice prevents straw man fallacy, it makes one's own arguments sharper and stronger, and um, I think that's important. Um, interestingly enough, Henri de Lubac does precisely that in his works on nature and grace. He presents his opponent's ideas extensively in response to their criticisms of his own thought. Um, and part of that is because, in fact, he was, in some ways, offering a critique of certain theologies on this topic. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute. But in contrast to that, in contrast to the example of Thomas Aquinas um, that Henri de Lubac also follows, I have to say that I feel the need to fraternally correct TNT regarding what has been in what has been inaccurately stated in their video about Henri de Lubac and his position on nature and grace. They make false claims, they grossly mis misrepresent his thought on the issue, and draw wildly inappropriate conclusions about the ramifications of his ideas. Um, first of all, contrary to, to Tim's claim, de Lubac was never actually censured by Pope Pius XII. Um, despite what people continued to purport, de Lubac was not the target of Humani January, so although a lot of people thought he was, and hey, we can disagree on that, all right? We can have an argument about that, but he was never censured by Pope Pius XII. From his own account, apparently he actually had received something, I think it was a letter or something from Pope Pius XII, that it encouraged him, saying he felt that de Lubac's work could prove very fruitful for the church. And de Lubac, when he was reading Humani Generis, was sort of struck by the fact that he read a, one of the main lines in it on this topic and said, well, I wrote the, almost the exact same thing two years ago. So it would have been 1948, because Humani Generis was 1950. Um, and so he actually read it and go, yeah, I agree. Like, this is what I, this is not against me. This is my position. You can't destroy the gratuitousness of grace. Um, so now we can have discussions on that. You know, we can go through the text and, and evaluate them, if you will. But um, anyway, it's not so cut and dry. He was never censured by Pope Pius XII. Okay. If I'm mistaken, hey, prove, prove me wrong and I'll admit it. I, from what everything I have seen and studied, he was never censured by Pope Pius XII. Um, he was prevented from teaching by his Jesuit superiors for some fear that they had that maybe he would be if he continued. Um, but de Lubac remained docile to that and obedient, even though he thought that they were misunderstanding him. Um, of course, a lot of, you know, I, I understand a lot of heretics think they're misunderstood. Well, but de Lubac isn't like Hans Kuhn or other people. I mean, he was very docile. He proclaims the need for obedience. Even if one feels that one is not being treated fairly, that one should not assume that that's the case, maybe they do understand you and you're wrong. I mean, he's written that in his books. Uh, the Splendor of the Church, for instance, he wrote that while he was prevented from teaching. And then another pope, I forget which one, actually used to use that as, it was sitting on his nightstand at night as reading, um, because he loved the book so much, and it's a great book, I encourage you to read it. Um, but anyway, the whole basis of how this came up in their video was the fact that Tim quoted from the website 1 Peter 5. There was an article there um, written by H. Reed Armstrong, who, according to the editor, um, says that Armstrong self-describes as not a certified academic, let alone theologian. So admitting from the start, he's not an academic, he's not a theologian. I'm not surprised, because the reality of it is, his presentation is completely inaccurate in his portrayal of de Lubac's thought. He obviously doesn't know the least bit about what de Lubac's actual position is on nature and grace, 
let alone the detailed arguments he employs. Tim quotes from the online blog post the following statement. Okay, So this quote that Tim gave comes from Armstrong's article on um, the website 1 Peter 5. Quote, the thesis of these essays, to Lubox, was that all men, according to their very nature, possessed one supernatural end with the graces sufficient to attain the beatific vision without the need of the added gratuitous gracious graces obtained through the sacramental incorporation into the mystical body of Christ. No. Sorry. No. If that were Dulubach's position, I too would be up in arms, but it is not Dulubach's position. It is not even close. Henri de Lubac was a theologian who vehemently affirmed that man needs God's freely given grace in order to attain the et et eternal beatitude in the beatific vision. He also wrote beautifully and extensively on the church in multiple books. He mentions the spun of the church, the motherhood of the church. He was in love with the church, you might even say. His ecclesiology was intrinsically tied to the Eucharist, and the Eucharistic ecclesiology he elucidated has had significant impact on Catholic ecclesiology in general, and in Catholic Orthodox dialogue in particular. Okay. Um, furthermore, despite the false implication levied by TNT that Henri de Lubac was anti-Thomist, he was not against St. Thomas's theology, especially on the topic of nature and grace. Quite the contrary, his concern was that Suarez and Cajetan, who were commentators on Thomas Aquinas that came centuries after Thomas, he, he was concerned that they had misinterpreted Aquinas' actual teaching, which was leading to erroneous theology being propagated and perpetuated in seminaries and universities via the manualist tradition. De Lubac's goal was to correct the inaccurate portrayals of and false accretions to St. Thomas's thought that had built up over the centuries. That was his goal. And thus, like Taylor Marshall in his doctoral dissertation, please do publish it, I'd like to read it, de Lubac went back to the source, to Aquinas himself. As Taylor says in the video, Aquinas uses the term duplex with respect to man's beatitude, which should be translated twofold and not two. Marshall is right. Duplex means twofold, and that was a major element of the Lubach's position against the Neo-Thomas commentators who are pushing St. Thomas's true distinction into an erroneous separation of nature and grace, of natural and supernatural beatitude. One of the Lubach's own articles on this topic is entitled Duplex Hominis Beatitudo. He precisely highlights the same point that it's a twofold, not a two separate beatitudes. And there's a twofold beatitude going on there. Um, yes, now de Lubac does hold, along with St. Thomas Aquinas, he would argue, that man has one and only one final end. There might be multiple natural proximate ends, but man's final end, meaning the, the goal of his existence is only one. There's one main goal, and that is supernatural beatitude. It is the beatific vision of God. It's a supernatural end. Um, and he holds that man concomitantly has a natural desire for this end, a natural desire for the beatific vision. Now, this is what a lot of the Neotomists were working against, but it, remember, he was arguing against them because he didn't think that they were faithful to Thomas. So he actually cites Thomas. He, I mean, his presentation, he goes over everything in Aquinas on this as well. I know that Taylor Marshall said he did the same thing, but de Lubac did as well. Okay, he scoured this stuff. And he cites Aquinas in several places to support his position. Just to give a couple of examples. In Summa Contra Gentiles, chapter 3, or sorry, uh, book 3, chapter 57, um, Aquinas states, it was proved, it was proved above that every intellect desires naturally to see the divine substance. Again, it was proved above that every intellect 
desires naturally to see the divine substance. And again, in De Malo, question 1, uh, 5. The natural desire of man can in no way be at rest except in God alone. Okay, once again, following Aquinas, however, Zulubach affirms that despite this natural desire, man cannot attain it by his own natural powers. He doesn't already possess this intrinsically in his nature. That's not what he believes, despite what that quote of that Tim gave says. He vigorously defends the fact that man cannot attain the supernatural end of the beatific vision of God without gratuitously given divine grace. Okay, nevertheless, God does not owe this grace to man. God remains free in his offer of grace. In fact, Lubach insists it must be a freely given gift to be grace. Despite the Neotomist objection that this is contradictory, de Lubach cites Robert Bellarmine, a favorite of TNT, often cited, and rightfully so. Robert Bellarmine is one of the greatest theologians in church's history. De Lubach cites Robert Bellarmine in his defense. Quote, It is neither new nor unworthy of the nature of man that he desires naturally what he cannot attain except by supernatural aid. And the second book on the sentence is Distinction 25, number 4. Okay. Bellarmine and Aquinas are the sources for de Lubach's position. So in light of this, I would invite Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon to admit humbly and honestly that their presentation of de Lubach in their video was inaccurate, and that while free to agree with Suarez and Cajetan if they so choose, De Lubac was attempting to defend St. Thomas's theology against those whom he viewed as perverting it. He does not teach what is claimed in the video. He does not teach that man can attain the beatific vision without gratuitous grace. He explicitly, emphatically, and repeatedly states the opposite. I hope that those I agree with and admire on many points, Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon, will be open to this criticism, take it to heart, and perhaps reevaluate a couple things. One, the sufficiency of their knowledge of de Lubach to form such strong and public opinions against him in general, and two, their understanding of his take on nature and grace specifically. Henri de Lubach at least deserves that his position be accurately portrayed before being maligned in a public forum by Catholics claiming to be Thomas. That's my response. I'm open to criticism as long as it can be well discussed. Um, this is important. We're talking about a man who gave his life in service to the church, who suffered a lot for the church, who a saint named a cardinal and saw great, yeah, he did, Pope John Paul II did tip his hat to him. Okay, maybe there's a reason. And I have no problem with people critiquing theologians that I like. That's fine. I like a lot of Bonaventure, some Thomas Stone. I like you know, there's, you know, I'm, I love St. Thomas, you know, um, there's a lot of theologians that I like that I don't agree with everything. I'm, I'm perfectly fine disagreeing with them on certain points and arguing it. Do that fine, but first present the actual position, represent it well and accurately. You can't be just maligning people and distorting their views and claiming, oh, well, this leads to this and that and religious pluralism, blah, blah, blah. No, come on. Let's, we're better than that. Okay? We need to actually know what we're talking about. And I'm, I hate to say it, but, you know, they like to be blunt. I'm going to be blunt. They did a piss poor job. Okay? It was, it's, it's, it's almost despicable how they're presenting this man. And I, I just, I think that, while it's fun to just kind of shoot the breeze and talk about this stuff in sort of a free-flowing manner, we have to admit that that can lead to a lot of problems, and this is being viewed by a lot of people who don't know any better, and they're going to take their word as gospel. They're going to say, oh, well, Delubach must be bad if they're saying this about him. Well, guess what? That's not Delubach. It's just not. And so that's what I have to say about that. Um, I'm not saying they can't critique Delubach. Have at it. I just want to see an accurate portrayal first. That's all.